Colleagues, I think we're going to now finally start. Um, welcome to you all. I understand a little French for, for colleagues who are going to present in French, but we have uh, our uh, translations, I hope. Oh, they've disappeared. Yes, yes. translations. No, they, yeah. Please, thanks, thanks, Janet. So um, please click on the language of your choice for this session. And um, I'll do my best to um, you know, manage any, any glitches if, in understanding if we need to do that. So, as I said, welcome to, to, global, to Assembling Genealogies of Modern Heritages. And I'm going to start straight away by inviting Ben Tusland to present Godwin and Hopgood within the GN Genealogy of Tropical Architecture. So please go ahead. You hear? Yes. Is that yeah, 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 sorry. Um, oh, okay, Ben, thank you. Uh, is my screen shared? It seems to be. Yes. Cool. Uh, okay, hopefully that's on full screen. Um, <clears throat> thank you, thank you for that. Um, so, um, John, uh, John Godwin and Gillian Hopwood are highly significant architects whose work has spanned across eight decades with much of it undertaken in Nigeria between 1956 and 2017. Uh, their office in Nigeria is still open today with the architect Biola Fiemi in charge. Within these years, Godwin and Hopwood worked on over a thousand projects to varying stages of completion and thus had a key role in the creation of post-colonial in and independent Nigeria's built environment. To narrow this scope down, this paper concerns the four years leading up to Nigeria's independence in 1960, which formed the basis for the rest of their careers in post-colonial Nigeria. Its focus deals with the importance of their experimental approaches to passive cooling techniques, while acknowledging capital's complex relationship with power and in turn biopolitics. Such physical building techniques, however, remain important today in studying architectural forms and methods that conserve energy in maintaining buildings. Godwin and Hopwood's experimentality was fostered in the decade before they arrived in Nigeria, where Hopwood worked on the designs for an army base in Cyprus for architect Alistair MacDonald, the son of the first Labour Prime Minister, James Ramsay MacDonald, who was noted for his investigations into materials, building science, and the promotion of building research. For Godwin, he has said that he was often marked out at school and at the Architectural Association, the AA, as being an experimenter, as shown here by the cantilevered reinforced concrete bench in his parents' garden at Causton in Surrey. He built one summer as a 20 year old. Um, constructed using knowledge gained from an AA module that focused on reinforced concrete. Both Godwin and Hopwood studied at the AA, often working closely together on projects in the studios. They were both taught by leading architects and engineers such as O. Varup, who held a degree of influence over their careers, in part due to this early connection, uh, coupled with his firm's influence in, in West Africa and 20th century engineering, uh, making unlikely project, un architectural projects into reality. The genealogy of tropical architecture, then, is a term popularised by Jiak Hui Chang in his 2016 book, the title of which merged the Foucauldian definition of genealogy with tropical architecture. For Chang, genealogical, genealogical study is, is where one seeks to understand the present condition with historicising how we got here specifically not, not studying it in a linear fashion or searching for origins, asking today's questions, for example, on the climate emergency, and answering them use, critically using historical sources. Tropical architecture has its own historiographical complications and is a term which Anthony D. King has called anodyne while masking controversial facts. His concerns being that tropical architecture was for people of alien cultures exercising colonial power. Furthering this, Ian Jackson has stated that the notion of tropical architecture is particularly problematic. A kind of modified European architecture enhanced to respond to hot climates and scientifically calibrated to suit the local conditions of particular countries. 
which, as Godwin and Hopp were conceded in their book on the artist Damas Nuoku, they did not admit to the significance of traditional design in the development of architecture in Nigeria in relation to thermal comfort. Demonstrating their work, particularly between 1956 and 1960, was an importation of European building that used the latest climatic technology and research to override any surviving vernacular techniques. Ben, I'm sorry to interrupt you, it's Laura. I do apologize. We need to just ask the technicians to put you on your presentation on full screen. And could you indicate when you want the slides changed because it's stuck on the, on the um, title slide? Uh, that's frustrating because I've been changing the slides. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what slide I've got it. I, can, can I have your see? slides open if, if you want me to share. Um, yeah, yeah that would be great. Yeah. Okay, just hold on. Okay, perhaps we could have your video as well. Uh, I'm currently uh, hotspotting Wi Fi oh. and I'm in rural <laughs> Scotland. So I have. Okay, very... no, we understand that. <laughs> okay. okay, sorry, Ben, for the interruption, but I think it was important to keep That's okay. your visuals. Okay, please continue. Um, what slide is showing? The scaffolding of a building. Okay, cool. Um, so that that was uh, uh, slide nine. So uh, yeah, this was intertwined into a complex context of demanding clients with tight budgets, who, as Godwin and Hopwood wrote in the recent architectural guide to Sub-Saharan Africa, were unfettered by restrictions in relation to building within a wider charged business atmosphere. The framework for Chang's study is based on Foucauldian analytics of power and conceptualizes a triangle of sovereignty, discipline, government, encouraging what he defines as a biopolitical analysis of architecture through this trilateral paradigm. He postulated that the colonial state aimed to install disciplinary power in different segments of the colonial population through biopolitics or the construction of buildings that would control the populace in a given manner. For Godwin and Hopwood, they only worked on a handful of publicly funded buildings during this period and therefore were producing a capitalist product for its clients based around comfort, driven partly by their own interest in improving conditions on the factory floor. Godwin and Hopwood's genuine interest and compassion for Nigeria is evident in them staying in Nigeria across their careers because of their love of its culture while assimilating into its prevailing professional structures. They both gained Nigerian citizenship in 2014, having taught in Nigerian universities, employed Nigerian architects, and worked closely in the forming of and consolidation of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. Yet in classifying their early architecture would be labelled as being of the problematic uh, tropical architecture category that other Western architects such as Fry and Drew or James Cubitt also worked within. <coughs> Godwin and Hopwood's work contributes to this category by tempering both climatic and social conditions, clarifying their form of modernism as a flexible means of building adapted to different environmental and conditions the building's use required. It was technocratic, based on empirical observations working closely with the British research stations and reading spe specification manuals such as Adolf G. Schneck's fen Fenster Ausholz and Metal, or win windows made of wood and metal. Uh, sorry, what was that? Was there? Um, such as uh, Thomas Bedford's principles of heating and ventilation, which Godwin has referred to being a Bible, having been enlightened by it during postgraduate studies on heating and ventilation. These sources of influence shows their work to be of techno-scientific problem-solving nature, rather than a conscious cloaking of architecture in a colonial ideology a criticism often levied at architecture of transnational variation, particularly of Western subjects in a colonial setting, and understandably so. Um, Godwin and Hopwood's earliest projects exemplify the condition of a colonial country going through a phase of modernization. The first three projects show this range with two unexecuted projects, job one being railway offices at Zaria, and job number two being a house for a private client both of which were abandoned, though drawings show a clear articulation of flat roofs with large eaves and significant shading techniques. The third, their first completed project, was offices for, West Africa, for the West African Examination Council, or WIAC, with its formation, land-owning status, and need for offices exemplifying the growing status for education, 
particularly in the Western style, and the requirement for educational buildings within a modernizing system. All three in plan and elevation exhibited a combination of the same features shown through various taxonomies of tropical modernism that have been written about in the established secondary literature on the subject, including Briselet, center hinge, center hinge windows, louvres, breeze blocks, and moving screens. Job number four at 27 Boyle Street is one of Godwin and Hopwood's most recorded buildings. It was their house and office for most of their time in Lagos following their move from Berkeley Street where they had lived and worked. The building itself is an essay in the forms of tropical modernism and the experimental characters of its architects. It typifies the flexible spaces found in the domino diagram by Le Corbusier, demonstrated by the steel frame used in Godwin and Hopwood's buildings, which bore the structural load of the building, thus freeing up the elevations for a combination of climate management techniques, techniques and expressive materialities or forms. The building is four stories in height and occupies a slender site overlooking a small park, with each story's facade being treated in a different manner. An assistant working for them at the time of its completion in 1959 commented that the building resembled a filing cabinet, a cheeky if little harsh observation when considering the way each story is an experiment in passively cooling the interior, with one, one floor retaining an awning, another with centre hinged windows designed in collaboration with Crittle, and another with their recognisable pierced block screen, all within a building on a slim site given which with the given spatial requirements of the live-in architects. And the specific proportions for this was taken from a feasibility project by the architects for a primary school in Lagos. Such climatic research was published by Godwin and Hopwood in 1955 when they wrote and presented three separate papers on the subject titled Design of Window Walls in Hot Humid Climates, Design on Ventilator Panels in Lagos, and design on solar screens using solar chart, charts and shadow angle protractor. These presentations and the research that went into them would have informed features such as the pierced block screen, which was used across a number of projects and unified their building with the buildings with the visual motif giving the facade, as Hannah LaRue has said, a woven rather than monolithic quality which is a linguistic link to God Gottfried Semper's observations of African grass cloths he had seen at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. And he published those in the same year in his, essays, the four, in his essay, The Four Elements of Architecture. 27 Borough Street was the first building to use their specific pierced block screen, which was constructed out of stacked rectangular components with a long slender block supported by two tapering stands, each of which would be placed upon top of one another. This would, have later, this would later have to be reinforced following the collapse of a screen during construction, possibly at the Nigerian Broadcasting Committee offices in Enugu, but would still be used, including uh, in projects such as the Northern Police College in Kaduna and a school for the blind in Lagos shown here. Given that these years were prior to the wide accessibility of air conditioning, its purpose was to passively ventilate buildings and provide shade or dappled light into to the interior. It is also noted that in a lecture in 1930, Le Corbusier had stated that architecture is about sunlight on floors, which had also influenced Godwin and Hopwood. LaRue summarized the building boundary in this case, uh, and I have applied it to the pierce block screen as being a filtering element and an aesthetic device that also mediates between public and private. She says this, of often, uh, this is often of a mechanical nature, which is not true of the pierce block screens, but more of the breeze soleil or the sunbreakers, which Godwin and Hopwood were using on other projects around this time. One such project was Allen and Hanbury House in Tinubu Square, Lagos, which was given permission to begin work in September 1956 and was completed in 1959. For this early period, in terms of typology at least, it was an anomaly given its commercial function when Godwin and Hopwood were soon to be known for their industrial and educational building work. It was built on a prominent site in Tinubu Square, with the public area surrounding it being reshaped uh, later to accommodate a building of such stature. Its prominence is exemplified by its height against existing buildings in a historic neighbouring Methodist chapel, with the concave pitched roof of the Schindler's Lift overrun visible from the corners of the square. 
its forms exacerbated by the blank facade that acts as a backdrop to the hipped roofs and a regular pattern in the foreground. Allen and Hanbury House is a case study for, in the importance given to passive ventilation through a facade constructed entirely of sunbreakers, owing to its orientation within the square, which could not be altered given the context of fronting the public space. In recent recollection, Godwin and Hopwood have noted that this project was the first where they could put into practice their research into tropical buildings, as shown with the angles of sunbreakers being dictated by sun path pattern diagrams drawn up at the conception stage. It remained functional with, building, with comfortable office spaces on the top three floors above a double height showroom on the ground and first floors fronting Tenebrae Square. As with anyone who has entered a large stone church on a hot summer's day, experienced comforting coolness, as Victor Olgay explained in his book Design with Climate in 1963, Allen and Hanbury's interior walls were clad with marble and the floor with terrazzo to both reflect, to reflect light. Both of these materials ensured that minimal heat was absorbed into the fabric, retaining a coolness to the room in their construction, they went further. Uh, and in, in the construction, they went further with the marble cladding touching the walls lightly through cemented spots, allowing for a cavity between the slab and the wall to ensure little heat conductivity. Owing to this depth of thought and attention to detail, Godwin and Hopwood's works generally hold a high degree of historic and architectural significance, specifically in relation to the development of a taxonomy of modern tropical architecture. Unlike their later careers, where they worked within a broadly independent and developing economy, the years 1956 to 1960 show their work within the last years of colonial rule, though their output did not sway in its empirical characteristics and relationship to capitalism. Debates surrounding tropical architecture are much contested, particularly in relation to post-colonialism. The buildings by Godwin and Hopwood of the 1950s contribute to these discussions and are of high importance when assessing experiments relating to energy conserving architecture through their passive cooling techniques. Relating the human body's comfort within the interior, whether this be for workers in a factory or office or residing in a comfortable home. As an overview, these case studies from the end of the colonial period in Nigeria, as designed by Godwin and Hopwood, are entirely climate responsive in their passivity to cooling rather than the actively cooled sealed skins of buildings in, in later decades of the 20th century. In, in terms of a Foucauldian genealogy seeking to use historical materials to bring about a revaluing of values in the present, as physical objects, their buildings therefore hold significance as a documentation of how to conserve energy in hot environments without the high energy uses, usage of buildings providing case studies in their built techniques relevant to architects and designers today. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. And, and thank you for uh, also keeping in time. It's actually 20 minutes each to, to speakers. Oh. And, and uh, so you did perfectly, thank you. <laughs> uh, given that we actually are running a bit late and um, we have four presentations in this, session, I'm going to uh, ask all the presenters to follow on consecutively. If there are a few minutes at the end of, of all the presentations, then we can have some discussion yeah. because we will have wrap ups um, tomorrow as well, coming out of that. So um, let's move straight on to our next presentation by um, Adam. Adeyemo and uh, Amole on the treasure trove of modern architecture Ero Sharon's Obafemi Awalawawa University campus in Nigeria. And it's a video, I believe, colleagues. No, 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 no it's not a video. Okay. <laughs> right. So please, um, dear colleagues, go ahead. Okay. Good day. I am Adekunle Adeyemo, a Jada Henkel, PhD fellow in the Department of Architecture, Obafemi Awalawa University in the Ife, Nigeria. And I am presenting today a joint paper with. Professor Bayo Amole of the Department of Architecture, Bafema University, who is the lead investigator for the Getty Institute's Gedenkel Foundation Conservation Management Plan project for the Obafemi Awolo University campus in Ileife, Nigeria. The title of our paper is A Treasure Trove of Modern Architecture, Area Sharon's Obafemi Awolo University campus, Ileife, Nigeria, 1960 to 1976. 
First, I give an overview of this presentation. I'll begin by discussing the inception of the University of Ife, now known as the Obafemi Awolo University. I think you should mute your mic. I will then proceed to speak about the master planning of the campus as a modernist city. Next, I will discuss how the architecture of the campus presents a reinterpretation of modernist architecture. After this, I will speak about the unity of the core area of the campus and thereafter conclude. The University of Ife, as it was then known, was founded by the government of the Western region of Nigeria, contrary to the recommendation of the multinational HB Commission, which investigated higher education in Nigeria in the year 1959 to 1960. The Western Regional Government passed a resolution at their House of Assembly and came out with their white paper on their plans to establish a university for the region. So as not to be inhibited by the then federal government, they said they would fund the university themselves, whereas the federal government was to fund other universities was establishing them. Also running contrary to the grain of the federal government who sought aid for, from the United Kingdom and the United States, they sought assistance from the Israeli government who under Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, was on a diplomatic mission to contribute to the progress of other developing countries. For the university project, the Israeli government in 1960 assigned them Erez Sharon, an alumnus of the Bauhaus, Dessau, who studied under Hans Meyer between 1926 and 1929. Sharon had worked in Meyer's office after his diploma until 1931, where they together executed numerous projects. This situates Sharon in the modernist tradition, a tradition it chose to stretch to its limits, which we will see shortly on the campus of the university. By the 1950s and 1960s, Sharon was the most prominent Israeli architect. As a first task, Sharon surveyed 16 medium-sized towns to select a suitable location for the university and recommended the Leife because of what he called the presence of basic development factors and existence of services. He cited other reasons for his recommendation as the favorable climatic conditions, the centrality of the town within the Western region, and the town being the cradle of Yoruba culture. His recommendation was approved in 1961, and a delegation of government officials together with Sharon was sent on a tour to study the plans and programs of some British, American, and South American universities. They also visited universities in Jerusalem. Sharon wrote that he noted the positive impressions the buildings and environments made on the Nigerian officials. Of course, this would influence his own work. Returning to Nigeria, a site two miles from the town of Ilefe was chosen for the campus with a plan to harness as much land as possible for the future development. The master plan drawn up by Sharon conceived the campus as a typical modernist city. And indeed, scholars have shown how the university has become a model for the city, even in a scientific sense. Having moved on from the days of the oldest continental universities to the days of the university campus as academical villages as defined by Jefferson, to, sorry, uh, to the days um, to now, um, this it being more or less like um, academic villages. And the campus emb embodies the modernist city's strict zoning principles. The three zones are the central or main core, which is here, and um, the students' residential facilities and the staff residential area shown this way. The service buildings and facilities are located between them in accordance with their relationship to the three sections. The main core is the central business district as any modernist city will have, and the main working area of the university. That's three buildings around the University Piazza. This is a picture showing the entrance to the University Piazza where you can see the university hall or the uh, secretariat on the right, the library here in the center, and the assembly hall is to the left. You'll see uh, more images of that later on. And these three buildings symbolize, symbolize the three main functions of the university, academic, social, and administration. This is reminiscent of what any modern city will have in the CBD. The student residences here are to the left of the main core and are conceived like the modernist mass housing projects, but they are skillfully adapted to st student living 
conditions with adequate living, dining, and study facilities. The staff quarters to the right are to the right day of the main core, they evoke a suburban setting involving over 25 housing types set in spacious, luxurious green surroundings. There's a strong emphasis on hierarchy of connecting roads, streets, and pedestrian ways all over the campus. For example, the students' residences are within walking or cycling distance of the main core, while the staff live within driving or motoring distance. Next slide. Um, next, modernist architecture reinterpreted. No matter the theory or manifesto one uses to examine the architecture of the Ife campus, be it Corbusier's five point towards a new architecture, Philip Johnson's seven crutches, or Bruno Zevi's seven invariants, Sharon's campus for the University of Ife was modernist, as can be seen by many factors and uh, features it entails. They, they include the pilotis, which is shown here in the uh, the assembly hall, the um, lower floor of the assembly hall, you see the building elevated um, standing on columns. And the same is used in some other faculty buildings like the administration, the law, social sciences, and education buildings. Another is the truth to materials, shown extensively in the use of stone and concrete. Features like board marked concrete we find extensively here and even in the basement uh, of other buildings. Um, reinforced concrete is used extensively, including large cantilevers, as you can see here in the Vice Chancellor's Lodge. We have folded concrete roofs here in the dining area of the Hall of Residence constructed in 1964. Furthermore, the modernist free plan is in play because the uh, structural support system does not utilize the walls as the main load bearing element. As a result of this, we also have the free facade. And you can, as you can see in the elevations of the buildings that they are not limited by any structural system. Uh, the long window, often not and long, made possible by the structure is also seen. As you can see here in the library building, this is the library and um, the humanities building. This is the, um, this is the secretariat building where you can see long white bands. Um, I mean, the building not interrupted by structural elements. The modernist monochromatic uh, color scheme of white and gray is used all over. We have dissonance, which is shown by feature, things such as asymmetry. There's a continuity between the building and the landscape. And there's, we see an abandonment of classical taboos. And all this evidence, the modernist credentials of the campus. However, Sharon reinterpreted modernist architecture because the campus shows a departure from the colonial modernist uh, or the colonialist modern that was in vogue in Africa at the time. And at the same time, it interprets formal modernist traditions. Two things particularly show this departure. The first is the rejection of applied climate control in favor of the form of the building as a climate controlling device. Something area Sharon himself defined as form follows climate at the International Health Seminar in Nairobi, Kenya in 1971. This is contrary to the popular tropical architecture of the period that employs a scheme to enclose the building in the form of screen walls or shading devices, louvers and precast ornamental elements as deployed by Macquefly and Jim Drew in the Colonial Government's University College Ibadan, now University of Ibadan, which was begun in 1951. Sharon reused the inverted pyramid to address the climate climate concerns, deploying the mass and shape for protection and ventilation, shown here in the humanities. This is the humanities block and the library is shown here. You can see the building gradually um, moving out and the education building, just an inverted pyramid. The upper floors overhanging the lower floors prevents direct sunlight, thus making the bu buildings cool internally. By making the lowest floors open and having internal courts in the buildings with roofs possessing avenues for hot air to escape. Just here, you see uh, there are, the floor is open, we have columns here, and then there is a, an avenue for the hot air to escape here. Uh, Sharon utilized what we now call the stack effect to facilitate passive cooling. Um, not only in this faculty of education building, it's also evident in other uh, buildings on the site. The other way Sharon 
uh, Stampos departed from the colonialist modern was in terms of his reference to culture. The architecture is replete with cultural references, such as the replica of the Ife staff shown here. It's, in Yoruba, it is known as Okwa Oromia. It is in, now uh, done in concrete by Sharon and is set in a covilinear concrete background on the way leading to the library from the University Piazza. Another is the abstract murals, which we see in the wall here of the um, University Hall and in the and on the walls of the amphitheater and the assembly hall. Sharon used corrugated texture for the wall grooves in the assembly hall, library, and other buildings, and in apparent reference to the grooves on the 14th century bronze figurine in the museum in Ilefe. He placed a, feature, a, a picture of the assembly hall showing the corrugated texture with one showing the figurine in his book, Kibbut Bloss Bauhaus, which was published in 1976. You can see this, that over here in the concrete um, obelisk surrounding the, in the, in the concrete figures surrounding the obelisk. Sharon employed a network of courtyards, a prominent feature of Yoruba traditional architecture on the campus. This we will see more clearly in the main core of the campus, which is in the next slide. Thus, Sharon's campus for the University at Ife was not only post-colonial chronologically, but also conceptually, as it rejected the British model not only in these academics, but also in the architecture. The main core of the campus is also worthy of special attention. Built between 1962 and 1976, it's about 240 meters wide by 240 meters long. It is the central business district of the campus and it embodies what we can call the Sharon design principles, not only in the buildings, but also in the landscape and circulation. The buildings, in the main core form a unified structure, although it bears different forms. For example, the assembly hall is hexagonal, uh, the amphitheater is semicircular, and the faculty buildings are rectangular. But a main idea that unifies the core area is the inverted pyramid, which is, you can see in the building. Uh, another typical modernist device in the main core is the grid planning defined here by walkways. The walkways are uh, mostly covered, run vertically uh, and horizontally on the site. And they are not interrupted by any feature. Whenever it seems to be interrupted, you can link it up with another walkway. The buildings are liftable by pilotis so that you can virtually walk through the buildings while going in any direction. This makes the circulation fluid while providing continuity between the buildings and the landscape, a critical modernist invariant identified by Bruno Zevi. Charo removed the rigidity, that will, the rigidity that will have arisen from grid planning by making the entrances of the buildings rather free. With no more formal entrances, the buildings become part of the landscape. The buildings are arranged to form courtyards, uh, like these buildings forming a courtyard here, we have a courtyard here, another courtyard. These are the ways Sharon uh, referred to the Yoruba architecture, which employs courtyard extensively. The buildings are erected into the landscape with the clever plane levels, which utilizes the natural slope of the site and provides linkages for the entire core. There's a blend of hard and soft landscaping with uh, sitting areas outdoor and under the buildings. Trees shading car parks and covered workplaces. For example, there's a car park shaded by trees and there are fountains. There's a fountain, uh, this is a fountain here in the University Piazza. In conclusion, the Obafemi Awolo University campus shows us again how modern architecture has become so open and can relate to context more. Sharon's campus adds to the varieties of modernist architecture that has become well-documented all over. It is particularly significant because it is linked to the very heart of modern architecture, which is the Bauhaus. 60 years on, Sharon's Obafemi Awolo University campus deserves more than a passing mention as ignoring it diminishes our understanding of the world's heritage of modern architecture. The architecture of the campus also evidences the fact that modern architecture keeps on evolving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adekuni, for, for a very interesting and well-illustrated presentation. Um, I'm sure that many of us are not familiar with this, this university campus. It was a pleasure to, to see, to view the slides. 
Thank you and to your colleagues. Uh, I'd like to move straight on. We're going into, into French now, chers collègues. So I will invite, without further ado, I think we've got, sorry, let me just find it. Uh, Mademoiselle Alisa Barry, who is going to talk to us on the heritage of independence for a modern approach to African heritage, the Ivorian and Senegalese examples. So Alisa, s'il vous plaît, et bonjour. Bonjour, Laura, merci beaucoup. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Can you see it? Hello? Yes, we can yes, see. Yes, we can. Okay, yes, thank sorry, you. We can. We can see it. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, bonjour à tous. Alors, uh, ma, ma présentation... Uh, Ma présentation euh, va donc euh, traiter donc, du des patrimoines des indépendances euh, avec euh, le, les exemples de la Côte d'Ivoire et du Sénégal. Donc euh, l'objectif, le, le, le but est euh, d'étudier sur une période de, de, de 1960 aux années 80 euh, ces, euh, ces, ces mouvements des indépendances et euh, tout ce que, tout, tous les types de patrimoines qu'ils ont pu euh, produire et créer, euh, voir quelle forme euh, ces, ces, ces patrimoines ont, ont pris, euh, qu'est-ce qu'il en reste aujourd'hui et finalement en quoi ils peuvent constituer euh, une approche moderne pour le patrimoine euh, africain. Donc euh, 1960 correspond à ce qu'on a appelé l'année de l'Afrique euh, parce que euh, ça, ça correspond à une année pendant laquelle euh, beaucoup, la plupart des pays, euh, des pays africains ont obtenu leur, euh, leur indépendance euh, comme c'est ce, le cas de la Côte d'Ivoire qui obtient son indépendance le 7 août 1960 et du Sénégal euh, qui obtient la sienne le, le 4 avril 1960. Donc ces deux pays sont intéressants à étudier ensemble euh, parce qu'ils ont déjà une, une histoire commune liée donc à, la, à la colonisation française, mais également euh, qui ont toujours eu une espèce de, de rivalité, euh, euh, que ce soit donc du temps de la colonisation à l'échelle de l'Afrique occidentale française, euh, mais encore euh, aujourd'hui, euh, puisqu'elle se, se dispute un peu la, la, la place de puissance, euh, à l'échelle de l'Afrique de l'Ouest francophone. Donc, euh, le patrimoine euh, culturel, euh, on a ici, euh, pour, pour le patrimoine, on a une définition euh, de l'UNESCO, qui, qui est issue du manuel méthodologique des indicateurs UNESCO de la culture pour le développement, et qui est assez intéressante parce qu'on y retrouve les notions de, de, de patrimoine culturel comme un produit et un processus. Donc, produit euh, qui euh, évoque le résultat de quelque chose euh, et qui, euh, dans notre cas, pourrait co correspondre à, à, au résultat de l'indépendance, des indépendances, et processus qui évoque un phénomène sur une longue durée, euh, euh, sur le long terme, et euh, qui, dans notre cas, euh, correspondrait au passage de, le, de la colonisation à la post-colonisation, à l'indépendance, et euh, à tout ce qui tourne autour, donc avec euh, la création de ces nouvelles notions. On a également donc, la, la notion de patrimoine matériel et de patrimoine immatériel, qui, comme on va le voir également au long de cette présentation, est, est, est très, très pertinente dans notre, dans notre cas d'étude. Euh, donc, qu -ce que, que représentent donc, ces patrimoines de l'indépendance On a dans un premier temps un patrimoine étatique qui est issu des, des, des nouveaux gouvernements euh, et qui, euh, qui tourne autour de, de la planification de ces, nouveaux, de ces nouvelles nations. On a également un patrimoine de la contestation qui va justement... Euh, venir en opposition à ces pouvoirs en place euh, et enfin un patrimoine populaire qu'on euh, qu pourrait finalement qualifier de vernaculaire puisqu'il est issu des pratiques, euh, des pratiques sociales, des, des pratiques du quotidien des, des nouvelles populations euh, citadines. Donc le patrimoine étatique euh, est finalement euh, un, un, une façon pour les, les nouveaux gouvernements en place de, 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 de se reconstruire, de reconstruire ces nouvelles, euh, ces nouvelles nations pour mieux régner. Donc, indépendance euh, rime bien sûr avec nouveau départ, avec euh, l'élection des, des nouveaux présidents qui vont devenir véritablement des pères euh, des, 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 des nouvelles nations euh, ivoiriennes et sénégalaises, avec donc le président Félix Oufouet-Boigny pour la Côte d'Ivoire et euh, le président Léopold Sédar Senghor pour le Sénégal, qui vont rester très longtemps au pouvoir, donc euh, 30, 33 ans pour euh, Félix Oufouet-Boigny, 20 ans pour euh, le, le, le Sénégalais Senghor. 
et euh, avec donc, c est, c est, c est cette indépendance euh, vont euh, surgir toute une, toute une série de nouveaux symboles pour représenter la, la nouvelle identité de, de ces nations. Euh, donc, on a les drapeaux, on a les hymnes nationaux, donc la Bidjanaise pour la, la Côte d'Ivoire et euh, l'hymne du Sénégal qui est écrit par le, le président, qui est aussi écrivain, euh, donc euh, Léopold Sédar Senghor au Sénégal. On a toute une série d'images et on a également donc, les, les fêtes euh, de l'indépendance qui vont, à partir de, de, de ce moment, être, être fêtées tous les ans pour euh, remémorer euh, ce, cette nouvelle page qui, qui commence pour l'histoire de la Côte d'Ivoire, du Sénégal et donc de, des nations africaines en général. Et donc, on va... Euh, également planifier la ville, euh, euh, essayer de, de proposer, de créer de nouveaux visages pour, pour, les, pour les grandes villes et capitales que sont Dakar, Abidjan et Yamoussoukro. Comme on peut, on peut voir à droite, euh, donc, euh, ce, ce sera des, des moyens pour, euh, pour, les, pour ces pays de vraiment démontrer euh, le pouvoir, de démontrer la grandeur euh, à, auquel on veut associer ces, ces nouvelles villes. Euh, et donc, ça va passer notamment par euh, la, la création de places publiques, de monuments, comme on voit donc à droite sur la photo, la place de la nation, qui, comme son nom l'indique, va vraiment devenir euh, la place du peuple, où justement, on va, on va, euh, on va, on va fêter tous les ans le, le, euh, les, la, la fête de l'indépendance. On a aussi, par exemple, comme on peut le voir à gauche, donc Yamoussoukro, qui correspond à la ville natale du, du président euh, ivoirien et dont il va faire vraiment donc, la nouvelle capitale et vraiment une, une ville toute, euh, toute, en, toute en grandeur, encore une fois, pour démontrer euh, le pouvoir, la, la grandeur, la démesure. Et donc, ça passe également euh, d'ailleurs par une, une architecture de la démesure euh, qui est associée euh, à, des, à des bâtiments, des monuments, euh, qu'ils soient administratifs, euh, qu'ils soient liés au monde des affaires, euh, à l'économie, à la finance. Euh, on a des hôtels, par exemple l'hôtel Ivoire en Côte, euh, Côte d'Ivoire à Abidjan ou l'hôtel Indépendance euh, à, à Dakar. Euh, et on a, euh, comme on le voit en bas à droite, la, la, la basilique Notre-Dame de la Paix à Yamoussoukro qui correspond au, à l'édifice le plus haut, euh, l'édifice chrétien le plus haut, même devant Saint-Pierre de Rome. Donc on, on est encore une fois dans la démesure, dans la grandeur, dans le pouvoir. Euh, et on, on remarque d'ailleurs que euh, les, les, les typologies d'architecture se ressemblent un peu de, de part et d'autre de, de, en Côte d'Ivoire et euh, au Sénégal, on retrouve parfois les mêmes architectes, comme par exemple le, le très célèbre architecte Henri Chomet, euh, qui est un architecte français. Et euh, on remarque d'ailleurs que la, la, la plupart de ces architectes sont en fait des, des architectes étrangers, euh, très très peu d'Africains euh, finalement pour euh, représenter ce, ce, ce nouveau type d'architecture. Euh, on passe également par la promotion des arts. Donc les, ces nouveaux gouvernements vont utiliser les arts comme, un, comme outil essentiel d'éducation, d'information, euh, de propagande pour final, finalement symboliser euh, cette nouvelle renaissance culturelle. Euh, donc ça passe donc, aussi bien en Côte d'Ivoire qu'au Sénégal par le, la création d'institutions de, de, comme les écoles des beaux-arts ou des, des institutions dédiées au cinéma euh, ou encore l'organisation de grandes manifestations culturelles comme le Festival mondial des arts nègres au, au Sénégal en 1966 qui va vraiment euh, représenter donc, la, la, la négritude qui est très chère à Saint-Gore mais également les notions de panafricanisme et encore une fois de renaissance culturelle. On a ensuite donc, dans un deuxième temps le patrimoine contestataire qui va euh, juste, justement utiliser euh, les industries culturelles notamment pour dénoncer ces nouvelles sociétés qui, qui, qui sont en, en train de naître, ces, euh, ces gouvernements euh, issus de l'indépendance. De Et donc, on passe d'abord par le cinéma, qui, devient, euh, qui est d'abord à la base donc un, un moyen d'affirmer son identité, de recomposer son image euh, pour se reconstruire et qui devient peu à peu un moyen pour enseigner, informer et promouvoir la connaissance des sujets et problèmes africains. Donc, euh, avec euh, notamment la, la charte du cinéaste africain qui est, qui est, signée en, qui est créée en 1975. Et donc, une des figures majeures de, de ce cinéma contestataire est le Sénégalais Ousmane Samben, qui est d'abord un écrivain et qui va finalement utiliser le cinéma parce qu'il se rend compte que, le, que le, le, les films, le cinéma, sont un moyen d'accéder de, de, à un plus large public. On peut faire référence, euh, par exemple, à la tradition orale africaine. Et donc, il va l'utiliser, euh, ce cinéma, pour faire la critique, euh, la chronique de la société sénégalaise et dénoncer, critiquer, que ce soit les problèmes de classe, d'urbanisme, de tradition, de modernisme, la condition de la femme, euh, la corruption, la, la misère, 
vraiment tout, tout y passe. Euh, on le voit même sur ses, sur, 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 ses, sur ses extraits de son film Hala, euh, la, la, la critique qu'il fait de la France, par exemple avec la France qui est toujours présente même après euh, ses indépendances, et ce rapport qu'on a encore du mal à trouver, euh, dans lequel on a encore du mal à se situer entre modernité et africanité. Et plusieurs de ses films, euh, d'ailleurs, seront censurés par les autorités sénégalaises. On a également la littérature avec ces trois grandes figures de la, de la littérature africaine, euh, ivoirienne, euh, par exemple, donc avec donc Bernard Dadier, Jean-Marie Adiafi et Amadou Kuruma, qui vont, de la même façon qu'avec le cinéma, utiliser la littérature pour dénoncer ces nouvelles sociétés, pour dénoncer, critiquer euh, ces gouvernements. Euh, on peut citer, par exemple, euh, « Les soleils des indépendances », qui est un livre de, de Kuruma, qui propose un regard critique sur les gouvernants de la presse de la colonisation. On peut également citer la carte d'identité de Dadiafi, qui est une réflexion sur l'aliénation africaine postcoloniale à travers les thèmes d'identité, de liberté et de dignité. Et enfin, on a les arts, avec une, une grande figure sénégalaise euh, qui est Jo Wakam et son laboratoire Agitart, qui représente en fait un, un collectif d'artistes, d'écrivains, de réalisateurs, de musiciens, et qui, qui va vraiment... Euh, qui vont vraiment utiliser ce laboratoire pour euh, dénoncer euh, l'idéologie de la négritude euh, qui est propre au président sénégalais Senghor euh, et qu'on retrouve beaucoup dans, dans, dans sa politique, dans la politique des arts. Euh, et donc, ce, ce, ce laboratoire, l'Agitart, va, va vraiment aller à contre-courant de tout ça, à contre-courant de l'école des beaux-arts et euh, de, devenir peu à peu un repère de la contre-culture dakaroise. Et on a enfin donc le patrimoine populaire, qui est finalement le, le patrimoine vécu, le patrimoine de l'ordinaire, le patrimoine du quotidien de ces, de ces nouvelles populations citadines euh, qui, sont, qui sont en train de naître et euh, qui vont simplement vivre. Donc ça passe par habiter. Euh, on, on, on a de nouvelles typologies d'habitat, de nouveaux modes d'habiter. Euh, on peut peut-être rappeler que pendant la colonisation, on a un système qui fait que euh, on, on, la ville se retrouve divisée entre le plateau, qui est euh, l'endroit où les, où les Européens habitent et travaillent, et tout autour, euh, les, les, les espaces réservés aux populations indigènes, euh, qui, qui sont complètement différents euh, dans, en termes d'architecture et d'urbanisme, euh, des, des, avec des, des habitats beaucoup plus vernaculaires, des constructions faites de, de, baraques, de baraques en bois. Et donc, à partir un peu avant des indépendances, et euh, ça va s'accentuer après les indépendances, on a euh, une politique de, du logement qui commence à, à naître, avec donc encore une fois de nouveaux, de nouveaux modes d'habiter, de nouvelles typologies euh, d'habitat et de logement, et euh, qui vont s'accentuer avec donc, le développement de la ville euh, qui se densifie au, de plus en plus et qui va créer donc, des banlieues et euh, de plus en plus également d'autoconstruction. Euh, des, des habitants. Les, les, les populations citadines se déplacent également avec l'arrivée de nouveaux modes de transport. Donc, euh, on peut parler en Côte d'Ivoire du Baka et, de, et du Woro Woro, ou encore au Sénégal du Carapide, comme on peut, on peut le voir sur la photo, donc, qui correspond à un fourgon euh, Renault français, euh, qui est complètement recustomisé euh, en, en utilisant des savoir-faire et des techniques euh, autochtones donc, euh, ça, ça, ça fait appel à la, à la mécanique, à la tollerie, aux arts, puisque comme on, on le voit sur la photo, euh, le, le car est peint en jaune, en bleu, euh, orné de motifs, de couleurs, d'écriture, d'amulettes et euh, d'objets magiques et qui et devient peu à peu le symbole de, de Dakar, euh, le symbole des Dakarois, euh, des citadins de Dakar et du, du Sénégal. Et en, enfin, donc on... Le, les populations se nourrissent et se divertissent avec euh, la naissance donc, de la street food. Euh, et un des, des exemples les plus parlants est le maquis en Côte d'Ivoire, à Abidjan, euh, qui va euh, être un, un espace qui rassemble. Donc, c'est d'abord un espace de restauration, mais ça devient aussi peu à peu un lieu de communication, d'information et de culture, puisque c'est euh, là que se retrouvent toutes les populations de tous bords, de, tout, de toutes origines, euh, et qui devient aussi peu à peu un, forum, un véritable forum politique euh, avant de se transformer le soir en, en espace de la nuit, en, en, en lieu de fête. Et enfin, euh, on communique avec, par exemple, Nouchi en, en Côte d'Ivoire, qui naît euh, dans les années 70 euh, à Abidjan euh, et qui correspond en fait à un argot 
euh, mélangeant le français et euh, les, les, les dialectes de, des ethnies qu'on peut retrouver en Côte d'Ivoire, euh, donc que ce soit le Djula, le, ba, le Baoulé, le Malinqué, euh, le Bété, l'Atié, le Soussouk. Donc ce, ce langage apparaît donc, dans les années 70, d'abord dans les quartiers euh, populaires défavorisés et les gangs, avant de peu à peu s'étendre dans le domaine de la comédie populaire, puis de la musique, jusqu'à être aujourd'hui le, le langage des jeunes puisque aujourd'hui, parler Nouchi euh, euh, correspond à être branché. Donc finalement, pour conclure, on, on voit qu'on passe d'un patrimoine dicté, un patrimoine issu des gouvernements, des planifications de l'État, euh, un patrimoine qui vient du haut, à un patrimoine vécu, un, un patrimoine qui est vraiment celui des, des populations locales, euh, un patrimoine euh, euh, vernaculaire. Donc on a trois types de patrimoine euh, qui correspondent à, à, à trois types d'acteurs. Et... Euh, euh, finalement, ça, ça nous amène à avoir une, une approche holistique du patrimoine culturel, puisqu'on a, on a plus cette vision euh, vraiment compartimentée qu'on a, qu a aujourd'hui du patrimoine, où on aurait d'une part le patrimoine matériel, d'une part le patrimoine immatériel. Non, là, on a vraiment un, un tronc commun qui est euh, cette, 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 cette nouvelle page euh, qui, se, qui commence, donc qui est celle de, 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 des indépendances et euh, des branches euh, qui vont s'associer à, à, à ça pour former d'autres types de patrimoine. Et finalement, ça nous amène à, à considérer euh, une vision moderne, une, une nouvelle vision euh, pour le patrimoine culturel euh, africain qui, qui serait euh, du coup plus actuelle, plus proche des populations et finalement plus proche de ma génération. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Alisa. That was, uh, I found that very exciting and, and really enjoyable to see your images. And um, a, a, a younger person's view on heritage, which we're so very keen to have. Sorry, I should put my video on. Uh, let me do that. So that, that, was, that was, uh, very stimulating and enjoyable. And I'm sure we'll, we'll be talking about some of those, those concepts, particularly uh, revolving around customs and, and intangible, contemporary intangible heritages that you've raised. Um, so let's move on to our, our final presentation, uh, which is Apo, who's going to talk about a traditional heritage inseparable from modern heritage, also in French. So, uh, mademoiselle, is it Mademoiselle Apo? Please. Bonjour. Euh, oui, c'est mademoiselle. Merci, Laura. Alors, je partage mon écran, c'est bien ça Oui. Hop, attendez, je vais déjà fermer ça. Uh, not coming through yet. Voilà, attendez. Euh, voilà, écran partagé. Hop. Oui, it's coming. Yes. Voilà, merci. Let's just make it lock. Parfait, merci. <laughs> Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Euh, je voudrais d'abord commencer par remercier les organisateurs de ce symposium pour le privilège de partager cette, euh, cette présentation, les travaux de recherche. Donc, avant de commencer, je voudrais euh, rappeler qu'en Afrique, il n'existe pas de dichotomie entre le patrimoine matériel et immatériel. Ces deux types de patrimoine interagissent euh, constamment et euh, se construisent l'un par rapport à l'autre. Et en Afrique, il y a aussi euh, un important euh, patrimoine moderne qui a été implanté euh, durant la colonisation. Et euh, moi, je me suis demandé euh, si, euh, dans les lieux où il se trouve, le patrimoine moderne a été euh, d'abord accepté, ensuite approprié euh, et intégré à des pratiques euh, traditionnelles et endogènes. Autrement dit, est-ce que le patrimoine immatériel africain a pu entrer en interaction avec euh, le bâti colonial Et si oui, euh, par quel processus et pour répondre à cette question, je me suis intéressée au cas de l'Abissa de Grand Bassam en Côte d'Ivoire. Alors, Grand Bassam est une commune qui se situe à 45 km au sud-est de la ville d'Abidjan. Mais la partie de la commune qui nous intéresse est celle et la bande de terre entre la lagune et la mer. Excusez-moi. Entre la lagune et la mer tout au sud. Donc voilà, alors c'est sur ce lido de terre que les... Voilà, voilà une vue aérienne de, de cette bande de terre qui est naturellement séparée du reste de la commune par Grand Bassam, de la commune par la lagune et la mer, 
et qui est très prisé pour euh, ces plages euh, durant les week-ends. Alors, sur cette bande de terre, les Ndima s'installent au 15e siècle. Euh, les Ndima sont euh, un sous-groupe du peuple à Caen. Ils sont donc originaires du Ghana et ils ont émigré par vagues sur, successives vers la Côte d'Ivoire en raison des guerres euh, qui, qui avaient lieu dans le royaume euh, Ndima du Ghana, des guerres de, de succession. Donc, ils s'installent sur la bande de terre et ils fondent leur euh, village. Et c'est sur cette même bande de terre que les Français s'installent euh, euh, et fonde en 1893 euh, le quartier France, qui est euh, la première capitale coloniale euh, de Côte d'Ivoire. Et, euh, et, voilà, et donc, vous voyez là le palais du, du gouverneur, c'était une architecture bon, tropicale, des maisons euh, à véranda pour permettre une ventilation euh, naturelle à l'intérieur. Donc, c'est un style assez sobre et euh, fonctionnel, avec des jardins à l'avant. Et si vous voulez, en 1900, euh, en raison d'épidémies successives de chèvres jaunes qui déciment la moitié des Européens qui y vivent, la capitale est déplacée dans une autre ville à jamais santé. Mais euh, le quartier France euh, demeurera le port euh, majeur euh, de la Côte d'Ivoire jusqu'en 1930 et euh, le centre judiciaire euh, jusqu'en 1960. Et c'est pour ça qu'en 1947, même si ce n'était plus la capitale, un événement majeur de la lutte pour l'indépendance s'y est déroulé. Euh, ça s'appelle la marche des femmes sur Grand Bassam. Donc, c'est entre 2000 et 4000 femmes qui ont marché euh, sur la prison située au quartier France pour demander la libération de sept indépendantistes qui étaient emprisonnés. emprisonnés pardon. Et euh, c'est un, un événement qui est aujourd'hui enseigné à l'école en Côte d'Ivoire. Alors, euh, voilà comment euh, se présente euh, la bande de terre dont je vous parle. Euh, à, à gauche, vous avez le quartier France et on voit bien qu'il est divisé en zones fonctionnelles. Et tout à droite, vous avez le village Nzima. Et donc, finalement, ces quatre zones sont inscrites sur euh, la liste du patrimoine mondial depuis euh, 2012, euh, selon les critères 3 et 4, euh, que je pourrais rappeler dans les, dans les discussions. Et, euh, et ce, cet ensemble est inscrit sous le nom de euh, ville historique de Grand Bassam. Donc, elle euh, abrite à la fois un patrimoine matériel et patrimoine immatériel en raison de la présence du peuple Nzima, de ses traditions sociales, de son organisation sociale et de sa royauté. Alors, en raison de leur proximité avec, historique avec euh, le quartier France, les Nzima ont développé un rapport particulier avec euh, ce dernier et ils ont réussi à se distancier de ce qu'ils représentaient dans le passé. Alors, le premier facteur, euh, il y a plusieurs facteurs de distanciation. Euh, le tout premier, les tout premiers sont, commencent déjà dès l'époque coloniale ou euh, enrichis par des années de commerce avec euh, les puissances européennes. Des euh, commerçants de Zima se mettent à bâtir des maisons euh, massives et inspirées du style euh, colonial. Et euh, ces maisons ont contribué à brouiller les catégories rigides entre colons et colonisés sur le territoire parce que, euh, euh, parce que les populations indigènes arrivaient aussi à. Euh, avoir des maisons massives dans lesquelles ils habitaient. Ensuite, un autre élément de distanciation, c'est ce dont je vous parlais tantôt, c'est la marche des femmes sur Grand Bassam, qui a fait du quartier France un lieu de mémoire de la lutte pour l'indépendance et c'est donc devenu un symbole de fierté pour les Ivoiriens et pour l'Enzima. Donc, ça a créé cette distance avec le passé colonial. Ensuite, l'Enzima pratique quotidiennement le quartier France, c'est-à-dire que pour rentrer et sortir du village, ils le traversent. Donc, euh, les, les bâtiments coloniaux, ont, pour eux, c'est une présence euh, presque naturelle et euh, familière. Et ils ont finalement euh, développé un attachement affectif important pour ces bâtiments. Et ensuite, il y a une inversion symbolique d'usage, c'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, euh, tous les services de la commune, en tout cas la plupart d'entre eux, sont concentrés au quartier France. Donc, les Dima vont quotidiennement dans des bâtiments coloniaux pour faire leurs papiers, etc., etc., alors, et le dernier élément, il est émique, euh, c'est-à-dire du point de vue des Nzima, ils expliquent dans leur tradition orale que quand ils se sont installés sur cette bande de terre, ils ont fait un pacte avec euh, le génie euh, des lieux pour obtenir son autorisation de s'installer et pour obtenir sa protection. Et ils expliquent euh, que euh, le village, le quartier France bénéficie également euh, de cette protection et c'est pour ça qu'ils le considèrent tout simplement 
comme une extension de leur village et comme un village, même si en réalité c'est une euh, ville coloniale. Alors, en raison de cette distanciation, les, les Ndima sont alliés plus loin et ils ont développé euh, un, une appropriation symbolique euh, du, du bâti colonial. Donc, on entend par appropriation, enfin, qu'est-ce que l'appropriation euh, euh, d'un espace C'est quand euh, cet espace est associé à un groupe ou une catégorie sociale au point de devenir un de ses attributs, c'est-à-dire de devenir un élément constitutif euh, de son identité sociale et de sa perception à l'extérieur. Donc, euh, cette appropriation symbolique euh, se manifeste à travers des actions et ces actions sont très visibles durant la fête de la Bissa. Alors, la Bissa, c'est la célébration euh, traditionnelle euh, de la nouvelle année Ndima. Elle se tient euh, tous les ans euh, au mois d'octobre. Avant, c'était la chute du fruit d'un palmier qui donnait euh, le signal. Maintenant, euh, ça se passe autrement. C'est tous les ans en octobre. Et si vous voulez, c'est un moment où tous les Ndima qui vivent à, euh, au, à, dans la commune de Grand Bassam, à Abidjan, dans d'autres villes ou à l'étranger, ils euh, se rendent dans leur village pour faire l'unité, comme ils disent. Donc c'est un grand moment de réjouissance où plusieurs groupes de danse se succèdent sur la place centrale du village qui s'appelle la place de la Bissa. Et c'est également un moment de résolution pacifique des conflits où des groupes euh, appelés euh, chansonniers se succèdent devant le roi et les notables et à travers des paraboles, à travers des proverbes, dénoncent les actions euh, qui ont été faites ou les propos qui ont été tenus par la royauté que la population n'a pas apprécié. Et ils le font sans risque de représailles parce qu'on dit que durant la Bissa, euh, tout est permis euh, et euh, le, le pouvoir échappe au roi et appartient au peuple. Donc comme je le disais, la fête se déroule traditionnellement au centre du village, sur la place de la Bissa. Mais elle a connu des changements majeurs. Déjà, dès les années 90, le roi décide de l'ouvrir au public, c'est-à-dire au nom Nzima. Et ensuite, euh, l'autre rupture, c'est en 2004, où le roi actuel décide de euh, créer un comité chargé de euh, professionnaliser l'organisation de la fête et de la moderniser. Et à ce moment-là, c'est le début de la festivalisation de la Bissa. Et ça, ça aura euh, pas mal de conséquences. Alors ça, c'est une scène de critique sociale. On voit donc le roi et ses, et ses notables, son porte-cane euh, euh, sur la gauche et à droite. Ce sont les groupes de chansonniers qui sont justement en train de faire euh, la critique sociale. C'est un moment qui est très, très apprécié. Et vous pouvez voir qu'il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de monde sur euh, la place de la Bissa. Alors, donc les impacts de la festivalisation, comme je le disais, sont nombreux. Euh, D'abord, le premier, c'est que euh, la, la Bissa, à la suite de cette décision, est devenue une attraction culturelle majeure de Côte d'Ivoire qui attire chaque année euh, des milliers, littéralement des milliers de personnes qui se rendent euh, au quartier France et dans le village. Euh, ensuite, euh, ça a des retombées économiques importantes, aussi bien pour le village, parce que les Nzima installent des restaurants ponctuels, euh, des lieux de fête ponctuels, et des retombées économiques également pour le quartier France, où tous les hôtels affichent complet des semaines à l'avance et les restaurants sont bien entendu pleins également. Et c'est aussi un moment intéressant parce que, si vous voulez, souvent, quand les touristes se rendent au quartier France, enfin, dans la ville historique de Grand Bassam, ils se cantonnent souvent au quartier France, mais pendant la Bissa, c'est euh, autre chose. L'attention la, est surtout euh, sur euh, le village de Zima. Alors, un autre effet, c'est que euh, la fête, donne, la fête ne, ne, ne se cantonne plus à la place de la Bissa, au centre du village, elle s'étend maintenant au quartier France, dans de nouveaux lieux. Et vous pouvez le voir euh, sur cette photo qu'il euh, y a des bâtiments qui sont euh, appropriés de manière ponctuelle, transformés en euh, lieux de fête, en maquis, en restaurants durant euh, la journée, et qui deviennent le soir euh, des pistes de danse. Et donc, pour les visiteurs qui euh, viennent euh, à la Bissa, quand ils voient cela, ils associent de fait le style colonial, les bâtiments coloniaux au Nzima. L'autre impact est d'ordre symbolique. Euh, euh, la, les, les, la royauté a recours à une communication événementielle euh, très importante et euh, les conséquences de cette communication, c'est que ça a fait émerger une nouvelle image du quartier France qui est systématiquement associée au peuple Nzima. Avant le quartier France, on pensait ville coloniale, plage, restaurant, mais aujourd'hui, euh, aux yeux du public, Quartier France rime avec Abissa. Et comment est-ce que la royauté a fait C'est que d'abord, ils ont eu recours aux médias, donc les médias traditionnels, radio, télévision, journaux, 
Et euh, dans, tout, dans tout leur discours, dans tout leur reportage, euh, les médias ont recours à une fusion ville-événement. C'est-à-dire, ils ne diront pas l'abyssa du quartier France, euh, l'abyssa, pardon, du village, ils diront l'abyssa du quartier France. Donc, on entend des phrases comme euh, l'abyssa du quartier France, l'ancienne ville coloniale vibre au rythme de l'abyssa d'Enzima, le quartier France est le centre névralgique des festivités. Donc, les médias contribuent comme ça, eux aussi, à l'émergence de cette nouvelle image du quartier France qui rime avec l'Enzima. Ensuite, la royauté, comme vous pouvez le voir sur cette photo, euh, crée des panneaux publicitaires qui sont affichés à Abidjan et dans d'autres villes. Et euh, sur la gauche, on ne voit pas très bien ici, mais à gauche, vous avez l'emblème de la royauté Nzima Kotoko. Et à droite, vous avez euh, la formule Grand Bassin Patrimoine Mondial de l'UNESCO, qui est une formule qu'ils utilisent systématiquement dans toute leur communication autour de l'Abissa et qui renforce l'émergence de cette nouvelle image de la ville coloniale associée euh, au peuple Nzima et qui montre qu'ils se sont appropriés, en tout cas de manière symbolique, euh, cette euh, ville coloniale. Et donc, pour terminer, euh, donc, euh, ce que l'Abissa euh, crée, c'est une fusion ponctuelle entre euh, le traditionnel, le colonial et le contemporain à travers des éléments de la festivalisation, une fusion euh, ponctuelle entre l'urbain et le rural, une fusion ponctuelle entre le matériel et l'immatériel. Elle renforce l'interaction entre l'ancienne ville coloniale, le village et leurs différents patrimoines. Et comme je le disais, elle renforce l'appropriation symbolique du bâti colonial par l'Enzima. Merci pour votre attention. Thank you very much, Afro. That was, that was a, a great pleasure to, to, to see the presentation, particularly on, on a personal note, I was in Grand Bassam a few years ago for oh. periodic reporting. So it's brought back some very happy memories for me. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and I, I do think your, your discussion on the festival of Abisa and the way it has influenced and brought the various quarters and cultures together is, is also adds on to the presentation that Alisa made uh, earlier. So we've, I think, had two, uh, two kinds of presentations. The, the first two really dealing with, with architecture and the built environment in urbanity, and the second two in French dealing with, with cultural traditions and, and their impact uh, and, and added richness to, to cultural heritage in generally. I found the session very, very uh, enriching. What I'd like to suggest is, would colleagues like to ask any questions? We could perhaps run for another five or 10 minutes maximum, just a few minutes into our lunch break. If, if there are any questions, I think we could probably deal with a few. Um, just uh, perhaps put your hands up so we can deal with it that way. If you do have any, I'm not seeing any at the moment. So I'm assuming that everybody really enjoyed and, and feels um, that they were very uh, enriching and uh, exciting presentations. Uh, yes, indeed. Sorry, I couldn't raise my hand. Okay, I'm no, looking. that's fine. <laughs> Rawala, um, Anthony, yes, please do. Can you just uh, let us know where you're from as well, just out of interest? Uh, I'm actually an academic from the University of Nairobi, an architect. I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the presentation on the university campus by Sharon, um, this University of Ife. Uh, I learned a lot today, given the fact that that particular location or the people of that um, locality chose to look to Israel to source their architect. But nevertheless, the principles of modernism were still uniting, you could see them. And I really like the interpretation, particularly when the presenter talked about, you know, rejection of uh, the British type of architecture, uh, tropical modernism by uh, Maxwell and Fry at the University of Ibadan. So mine is not really a question, but I just wanted to commend the presenters. I really did enjoy that presentation. It was very well articulated. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that really positive in, uh, input. I see Olga, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. 
Yes, uh, it's it would also be a comment more than a question, but I'm really, um, I mean, um, it's a, the, the last presentation was so thought provoking for me, um, uh, thinking about the core and the periphery <laughs> that I suggested at the beginning. Um, I actually checked on the map that the village of Nzima was actually uh, or is included in the World Heritage Site together with the Quartier, uh, with Quartier France. Uh, so for me, it's almost like um, the core and the periphery being acknowledged uh, together. And then thinking about um, how Professor Mbembe defines heritage as um, something uh, not really about conservation of old forms, but creation of new ones. So that process of festivalization, or whatever it would be in English, um, it's really interesting for me from that point of view. So how the local communities actually, um, in a way, take over and, uh, and create new forms of life for the future, for their future, using uh, the past. So really thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Olga. Uh, Mike. Please go ahead, Mike. Yes. Uh, Pro sorry, we uh, should probably all uh, just say who we are in Mike. case people don't know. I know Olga spoke, so we know we know Olga. Mike. Yeah. Everybody I'm Mike knows Jana, you, um, <laughs> I'm for I would think that I, I'm just uh, helping here in the modern heritage of Africa and I'm a uh, advisor to the uh, director of the World Heritage Center. So um, I, I would like to really ask uh, Olga and also the, um, the presenters whether in fact fusion is acceptable as an answer to liberation. Do we see that the new modernism can actually be syncretistic in its creation of a trans modernity? That's quite a, uh, an Touch interesting more question. to Olga, more to <laughs> Olga. <laughs> Maybe to Olga perhaps, but anybody I think could respond. This could be the start of a very- I think, I think the main thing is, is that where are we going? How much of the baggage, colonial baggage, are we going to be taking on board? And how are we taking it on board? Is this part of our rupture or part of our continuity? Yes, thank you, Mike. Uh, a very interesting question and one that would really uh, require um, some time to reflect. But considering that uh, the decolonial scholars, the, 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 uh, the seminal scholars, they actually uh, consider that the transmodern culture, which is a futuristic project, right, would assume the positive uh, aspects or positive dimensions of modernity, positive moments of modernity, I would say that yes, it is possible that some kind of fusion is possible, but it would need to be made on the, um, uh, it, it's the cultures from the periphery that would need to have the say. So um, I didn't have uh, enough time to present the whole process of how to create the transmodern trans uh, culture. Actually, Dassel speaks about it. And that process starts with affirmation and self-valorization by the cultures themselves. But at some point, the cultures from the core uh, are included. So there is a dialogue. That's why I, I was thinking about an intercultural dialogue that is possible once it comes from the periphery and then includes the, the people from uh, the center. Uh, but it's done on, uh, according to the rules established by the periphery. Uh, the, uh, the input from the people from the center is needed uh, as a, a critical thought in a way that is included in the process. And at the end of that process, the last stage, it's actually, um, uh, uh, um, it's a very long process of uh, uh, whatever, um, however he calls it, uh, um, cultural, uh, let me check quickly cultural resistance. And the resistance includes not only uh, resistance against the elites of the dominant cultures, but also the Eurocentrism of elites in the peripheral cultures themselves. So it is a long process, but to, to answer short, uh, shortly to your question, yes, I do believe that 
um, there is the process of fusion is possible. Very, very interesting uh, debate, I think, coming up there. I also think that the last presentation started to, to open up some understanding of this kind of fusion that might be happening in Africa. And I think after that, unless there's anybody else, I don't see anybody else with burning questions. I think we need to park that debate to take forward, Mike. I think it would be very stimulating. I just want to um, thank our four presenters again. I think the session was really very interesting and very stimulating. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I understand we are now let loose for our virtual lunch, lunch break until two o'clock when we go back to, let's see, we, we go back to uh, uh, breakout sessions again. So we'll probably have a short plenary and then at two and then we will reassemble. So enjoy your little break and um, we'll see you all a bit later on. And thank you very much once again. And thank you, Laura. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>